Okay, it's uh, 3 p.m. Uh, we'll make a start. Thank you to everyone for uh, joining this call. Uh, my name is John Craig. I'm co-chair of the PSA's Learning and Teaching Network, uh, along with uh, Donna Smith. Um, we're glad to welcome uh, Mark Shahan uh, today to talk uh, to us and lead us in a discussion around how we support students uh, in this extraordinary uh, time. Mark is a um, political scientist at the University of Reading. He's uh, head of department at Reading. Uh, his work is, as I think, broadly speaking, uh, a political historian uh, focusing on American uh, politics and government. And he's uh, got, uh, had uh, experience as well working in journalism and in business communication. Mark's been active in, I think, PSA and BISA uh, for a number of years uh, in teaching and learning um, and has presented to us a number of times uh, in various PSA and uh, joint conferences uh, on how we can best support students in uh, times of crisis to support their uh, mental health and well-being. And he's kind of agreed to uh, lead us in today's session. So, um, Without any further ado, uh, Mark, uh, do you want to take it away, please? I will do. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thanks, Donna, as well. Thanks, Jamie, also from PSA, for everybody who is making this possible today. I have to say, in terms of technology, if this involved pigeons and steam, I would probably be on safer ground than I am now. So, no, not many bissel whistles, no bells today, gonna to keep it fairly straightforward. But thank you so much for joining this session. We've got about an hour and I tend to talk too much generally. So I've structured this so that we cover a fair amount of grounds that you get to share your experience and hopefully learn from others. And also so that you don't get overly bored of my voice. Now I'm gonna try and share a screen so that you don't have to look at me either. Um, and whoops, this one actually. Scream in the chat if um, my slides have not appeared. Uh, essentially, this session is drawn from a live workshop that I plan to lead at the PSA conference in Edinburgh in April, uh, which was to be called, I'm not your dad, I'm not your best friend, but I am someone who'll listen. And it was to explain our academic tutoring system. Um, let's see if I can actually move these slides forward. Um, which we introduced at Reading about 18 months ago. And it's about what we've learned from the last 18 months at Reading with particular reference to supporting mental health challenges. Uh, in short, the structure has sought to separate pastoral care from academic, personal and professional development. The university is building a strengthened student welfare team, while in parallel is creating opportunities for academic tutors, we used to be personal tutors, we're now academic tutors, uh, to build our skills in supporting students' academic and future employability needs. Um, Teachers and other school staff will return during Ooh. the classroom. I don't know what the noise is in the background there, but we hopefully will get past that. In practice, the culture change necessary to embed our new academic tutor system has been slower than we hoped. The demand for welfare services, and you'll see that an academic tutor is not supposed to be responsible for these. Um, the demand for those services has well outseeded, exceeded the supply. And equally, I've never yet seen a student come to me with an academic issue that hasn't had a pastoral problem underlying it. Unlike my colleagues across politics and IR at Reading, I'm not prepared just to pass those students on into a queue. And while I'm not a trained counsellor, and nor would I, or indeed should I, step into that space at all, my experience is that a sympathetic ear and talking through the challenges our students face can go a long way to making the mountains their issues have become a lot more manageable and navigable. So in terms of structure for today, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more. I'm going to get you to talk to each other. Then I'm going to get some of you to talk to me before we all talk to each other. So is that clear? I hope so. Um, but of course, the key to all of this will be listening. 
So John gave me a, a lovely introduction, which has kind of taken out three paragraphs of what I had to say here, but I, I will summarize. So what gives me any credibility to talk to you today? Uh, I'm currently head of department for politics and IR at the University of Reading and have been in that role for just about two years now. Prior to that, I had two years as director of teaching and learning. And before that, I had a very short academic career. On the 31st of August 2015, I was the lead communications consultant on a project to create a new communications framework for Volkswagen Motors in the United Kingdom. It was the latest in a long line of change in communication projects that had seen me work for or with the likes of Barclays Bank, Unilever and Diageo over more than two decades. On September the 1st, 2015, I became a teaching fellow at Reading. I'm quite glad I did. Eight days later, the emission scandal broke for Volkswagen and every consultancy working for them was kicked off site. So I would have been out of a job anyway. Um, Becoming a teaching fellow gave me an absolute new lease of life, teaching modules in both British and American government and researching in American domestic politics particularly. A couple of promotions have taken me out of a fair bit of that teaching and into the heart of departmental administration to, to a role with little actual power in the university structure and the opportunity to change things only through influence. I also bring the insight of a dad who's seen all three of my children head off to four different universities between them. One has flown through two at undergrad and masters. One is completing her second year as an undergrad. And my son headed to university in 2014, but sadly did not return. That's changed my life forever, shaping my approach to how I work with students now and particular how I'm trying to support them in this unprecedented time. And to deliver this session in Mental Health Awareness Week has a special resonance for me. Now, normally for us, certainly in my experience, head of department is a staff focused role built around workload, PDRs, herding cats, largely cats with PhDs, while the DTL role, the Director of Teaching and Learning, is the prime student facing role. Now I moved from DTL to Head of Department and when I did so I didn't want to lose that student facing approach, so I haven't. And in the last 18 months we've had this switch from being pastoral carers to being largely academic carers. Our senior tutor has become the school director of academic tutoring. Um, going from leading both on pastoral care and on student discipline to supporting academic tutors and liaising with the student support team covering a far wider range of departments and schools than just ours. Now within my department we've become more of a student focused team. There's a team of three of us particularly that take a key role in that and a leading role. Um, in reality, our whole change to this new AT process has put a greater onus on academic tutors to stay in close touch with tutees. And this has become even more important as our students have dispersed and we've all gone online. So what have we been dealing with since we've gone online? Well, the positive of it is that 80% of our students are fine for at least 80% of the time. Uh, we have kept in very, very close touch. Everything points to the majority worrying at first and we had a burst of activity for these students around all of the major announcements, particularly concerning assignments and exams for this summer. There was a, a degree of worry at first, but we have largely overcome it. However, we have roughly 20% of students who face very significant issues lack of access to technology. That is a really important one. For some, we have students all over the world. There are a number of our students who are engaging through uh, with the university at the moment via a smartphone and very, very dodgy broadband. 
Some are stuck overseas, having gone home. Some gone straight into quarantine. They are feeling very remote from the university. Another group of our international students have been stuck in Reading. I was talking to one of my uh, part one tutees, first year tutee this week. He's in a hall that normally has 200 students in it. He's a Russian lad. He's there with three other students. They're really feeling this at the moment. They're not seeing many people around the university, even though we have a beautiful campus and they can at least get out and work around that. Um, we have a number of students working without their normal physical or mental health care support. The university is very good in giving support. It is largely overwhelmed at this time, but a number of our students who have PAs, who have personal assistance, both for their physical or sometimes for their mental health care needs have lost this support. We're having to work with them. Working in environments not conducive to study. I was on a Teams call this morning uh, for, with one of my students whose partner is a healthcare worker. Now, six days out of seven, he takes the one laptop that they have and she has to work without that. They're working in a shared house where there are six other people. I've got other students who've gone home to houses with six, seven other siblings around where maybe they share a bedroom, certainly some of them do. Uh, ver various issues that make it really hard to work. And of course, most of our students work and most of those jobs have disappeared over the last eight, nine weeks. And now they are facing uh, from a significant to indeed a total loss of income. And we're having to work with those students a lot, all the time. They demand more support, sometimes from elsewhere. And I can share with you the very good resources that my university has. I'll share these slides afterwards, which has links uh, to those resources that we don't offer because we are not the specialists, but as academic tutors, we are signposting people towards. But sometimes the students can't get to those services as well. And when they are looking for help, when they're looking for support, even when they're looking for validation just for what they're doing, their first port of call is the people they know. And rather than going to any central function in the university, they are coming to the department. One of the things that I would like to show is the academic toolkit. Now this will be if uh, the broadband of Princess Risborough Buckinghamshire is actually working. And thankfully it looks as though it might be. So all of our academic tutors have uh, access to this material. We use it a lot when we're talking to our students. A lot of it is uh, triaging them to other places. It is the signposting. Some of this signposting is quite good. That is uh, very small, so if I can make it a bit bigger there. But you can see, if you are facing particular kinds of issues, where do you go to? What, what is that concern? Where can we steer people towards? And it is very useful material. We are using that quite a lot. Sometimes things go terribly wrong. I'm not going to go into the student emergencies page, but what I can tell you is that one of the tools that's within that is something called a notification of concern. And it's when you might have been on a call to a student or that student um, might be showing very visible um, or other cues that are showing that they are in a state of emergency, a state of panic, a state of despair. We can actually call in the cavalry. Uh, in all my time at Reading, I've used it only twice. Uh, one was a case of potential suicide. I'm very glad we got to that student at the right time. It does work and uh, it works quite well. Right, let's get off that one and go back here. Um, communication is clearly the really big thing for me, uh, both as a head of department or in fact in my academic tutor role. And it's how we have made our work with students over the last seven or eight weeks work. Normally we have a very buzzy department where we see a lot of our students, I've described it before to people as we are the cheers of politics departments. Everybody knows your name. We're not that much bigger than a lot of sixth forms. We have an intake of about 130 students a year. 
it's really, really difficult when we're not seeing those students in front of us, when they're not seeing us, when they can't come along in a corridor and knock on my door or knock on any of my colleagues' doors. Uh, so we've had to find other tools and other ways and means of communicating with those students. Some rules that I've been sharing with my colleagues, um, we don't just transmit. Most of what we do has to be listening. It has to be responding. It has to be finding the, what, the right way to the right solution with that student, which is why not one size fits, fits all. For me, in any circumstance, and, and that's quite difficult in a, a university with 18,500 students, where there is a lot of that big transmission communication, particularly at the moment. And this is where the department becomes another interface for students and a much more personalized one. Equally, once we start communicating, we can't stop. We cannot just turn it off. The expectation is built with students that they are going to have conversations with us. And the last thing I would say is that any communication we have, any contact that we have with a student is not going to be that universal panacea. We're not going to have all of the answers, but sometimes I might know a woman who does. I might know someone who is better informed than me, and I can be the conduit for the student getting the information that they need. Now, for me, coming in from a communications background, I probably had a little bit of a head start in working with my team uh, as we adopted our new rules of engagement with students. But the most important thing for me from the beginning has been knowing my team, knowing the 25 full-time equivalent academics in my team, knowing the sessionals and the part-timers around us and how they're doing. What are their challenges that they're facing? What are, what are they uh, having to deal with in their own homes? What capacity do they have to be able to deal with our students? Some have very large childcare responsibilities uh, or elder care responsibilities. Others, to be honest, are just not overly interested in students, at least until they have two degrees. Uh, then suddenly a PhD student might become uh, quite interesting. Not all of my team are natural communicators. We have quite a lot of introverts, weirdly, among the academic community. Who knew? Um, but we have quite a lot of people who are really not comfortable in reaching out to students in the proactive way that we'd like them to. Now, I need my academic tutors to be doing that. And sometimes it means people doing stuff that they're not comfortable with. But in other instances, it's finding the right member of staff who can engage with that student or with that group of students. We know that this goes beyond anything we've had to face before. Um, we need students to recognize that we understand that, but that we're also going through that with them. That in many senses, we are one team. And I'm really trying to stress with my student community that we're all part of the same team. We're on the same side here. And that's about showing that we care. It's not just passing off the formulaic emails. It's actually engaging. And this, what I said right at the beginning, it's listening far more than we talk. Um, it's being consistent. It's trying to make their life a little bit simpler at the moment. It's also speaking to them on their terms. And what I mean by that is not using the jargon of a big bureaucracy, that we're all part of big bureaucracies. And no doubt we're, we've all got deans and PVCs and heads of faculty and whatever it may be speaking to us in the lingua franca of politics academics. 18 year old student, student from the other side of the world, um, student from a diverse background, probably doesn't speak that language day to day. So we've got to find a way that we connect and that they want to come back and continue that conversation with us. So I've actually asked my students a little bit about how they think this whole process of communication is going. Loads of caveats with this. Um, we have around about 500 students in the department, probably something like 15% of them have responded to this. 
Uh, it's a very quick pulse check. It's something that uh, I will be doing on a weekly basis with a few questions, not with all of the ones here. But there was a real spread on how they felt that the university has communicated with them so far. The big bureaucracy of the university has been a lot around transmission communication. It's been sending out often quite dense information and waiting for a response. So I asked whether the experience with the department was any better, and it is a little bit better. At least it is largely okay. And if I get to okay, that's a pretty good start point for me. Uh, we can build on that as we go through the summer. What I wanted to check with people was um, that they understood when stuff was coming from the center and when it was actually coming from us. Luckily, 85, 86% do recognize that. I can work on the other 14%. Who had they heard from? Um, they'd heard from all of us. They picked on me. I'm probably the noisiest. I'm, I'm the most visible name. I do talk a lot. I'll contact students a lot. What had been useful, they wanted to know about their own work. They wanted to know what was happening in the department. They wanted the information. They wanted everything about exams. It was, there were no surprises, and that's really been my goal. I'm working on having no surprises in the kind of communication that we have. Um, what do they want from us now? It's pretty much the same. After the initial shock and the panic and everybody leaving campus, People have settled down. They want a steady flow of information that enables them, and we know all students are quite selfish, and of course they are, enables them to get through this year and understand what next year is going to look like. What kind of communication do they want over the summer? Well, the one that factored most for them was emails. But that may be a self-selecting group who have responded to a survey that was communicated to, the, to them via an email. So I wouldn't put too much credence to that. If you look at the second most popular one was one-to-one -one with staff members. They want to be able to get hold of the right member of staff and to be able to talk to that staff member pretty much on the, their own terms. The one that came last out of the choices that we offered was social media. Even though this is largely a social media generation, what they really, really do want to hear from us is based on uh, that one-to-one -one contact. We'd love it to be face-to-face. -face. If not face-to-face, -face, then in our case, it's Teams or it's Blackboard Collaborate or it's Skype. It's uh, The university doesn't like Zoom, so I, I rarely do a Zoom call here. But it is all for me about managing students' expectations. What kind of tools have we used for that? You'll be glad to hear I'm nearly finished. Um, we have used a lot of, of group-wide emails, but we've been slicing and dicing, understanding that not one size fits all, and we have to have stuff that is relevant for year groups. We have to have stuff that's relevant for PGT students, for international students, for students who are still in halls, whatever it may be. Uh, lots of module-specific content. This is the stuff that has really mattered to them. Now we are in mid-exam season and it has been getting the right content on. It's not just all totally focused on the materials within the modules. A lot of it is audios, videos around um, styles of learning, around how best to perform in the exams, all of that kind of thing. So lots and lots that they would normally have got by coming along to their academic tutor meetings. Teams calls. We had a great Teams call just before our dissertations uh, were due in. It's about a week before I got two of our recent graduates to talk through their experience of closing out a dissertation. That's had fantastic feedback. We're doing similar ones this week uh, around uh, getting the most out of take-home exams. Uh, again, using a couple of older students who come in from other institutions where that was just the way of life for them before. So it's making this specific to the student needs. Uh, I do insist on weekly academic tutor contact. It's quite easy for some academic tutors to disappear to go quiet and for students not to be able to get hold of them. As far as I'm concerned, that is a PDR issue. That is something that I will be taking up and actually how 
a colleague works as an academic tutor is going to be important in the promotions process in the future. It's not something that somebody else does. Uh, if we teach within the department, we all do it. Dissertation supervision, the same kind of thing. It is the weekly contacts. Our dissertations are in now, but we're just starting on master's ones, so that doesn't stop. We tried discussion boards, tumbleweed. People really didn't want to know. We are having another go at them now, particularly with our postgrad students, um, but much more seeded and moderated discussion boards. Uh, why didn't they work for us? Well, we found out actually that there is an awful lot of Facebook group chats that the students are going to, and they are far happy there than in a discussion where they think we might be looking. Course rep conversations, if I want to get into those group chats, my best route to that has been the shortcut of talking to my half a dozen course reps. Uh, one of my course reps is going to be a SAB next year, a sabbatical officer in the student union. He has been fantastic as a link. Play on those links, use the people you know, use the, the people who are influencers within your organization uh, to find out how you can seed messages, how you can get uh, those messages you really want students to hear and to understand and to break through a lot of the false narrative that is going on in group chats. Specials. Now this for me raised the issue of personal phone numbers and personal privacy. Uh, through our database of students I have access to phone numbers for students. Where students have gone completely quiet on us I have texted them to see if that is another way that I can find out what's happening. Now, normally they would see my phone number. I am very lucky the press office uh, uses me quite a lot in the university and they have given me a second phone for press information. A cheap burner where you don't care about students having that phone number and where there are strict rules so that they are not texting you at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. Uh, or at least not expecting a response can be quite useful, but I know it is a thorny issue for some and I'd quite like to see other people's views on this. Social media posts. We thought we were going to use social media a lot. I live half of my life on, on Twitter. Um, some students engage, lots of students don't. What I would say our experience has been is don't go down any one channel. Keep trying keep using different tools, find the ones that connect, keep mining those, but work around it. Signposting, as I said, to lots of other activities uh, across the university. We're quite a social department, and we've also been setting up virtual coffee. I'm gonna come back to me for the moment here, actually. We've also been setting up virtual coffee breaks and catch ups with students. We have a virtual pub quiz that's coming up on the last day of exams. Um, we might have a universally challenged, which would be our version of university challenge, which we've done before. And one thing that I am really um, interested in doing is having a celebration for our finalists when the results are announced. This year is the group who are not going to get a lovely summer graduation. And it is vital that we do something for them. I want to get them all back in the winter. I hope they will be part of our winter graduation. I hope that can take place in a proper face-to-face -face way. But even if we can only raise a glass across a Teams call, uh, prior to, I tell you what, I would invite them around to my back garden, socially distanced for a beer, if such a thing could be achieved. It's quite difficult with 130 graduates. Um, we will do something that makes them feel special on that day because they have gone through three or four years of really, really life-changing hard work and it would be awful for them just to leave on a damp squib. So that's the Reading Politics and IR story. We are by no means perfect and like everybody else we have reacted and got lots of things wrong. Um, we're attempting to turn that round now so that we communicate proactively far more and aim to anticipate and plan our contact with students through to the end of term, across the long summer and into their return to whatever our new normality looks like. 
And that is where I would like to take us now. So thanks to the wonders of Zoom science and to Jamie and uh, great skills in using this. We're gonna break into rooms now. So each of you will be assigned a room for the next 10 minutes or so. And you'll be in rooms one to nine. If you are in rooms one, two or three, I'd like you to look backwards and assess how you've coped with the demands from students since we went online in March. It would be good if someone could scribble down a couple of notes. It would be really, really useful if someone would be prepared. Okay, so I think we're all now back in the main uh, discussion area. Mark, we've got, I think, 15 minutes. How do you want to do this? Do you want to kind of uh, get a spokesperson from each group or? Yes, please. That would be really good. And of course, room number one think that I'm going to come to them first, if they even realise that they were room number one. So let's go to room number three. Um, and uh, does anybody who was in that third room talking about uh, their experience up till now, can you feed us back a pearl of wisdom, insight and something that we'll take away after this meeting think it about think about it about 24 minutes past five and go wow no pressure the group i was in we were in the first uh three i'm not sure whether we group one two or three but i'll i'll pitch in and see if this helps i think one thought we had was uh, in communications to students um, we can helpfully send something out which doesn't necessarily need a, res a positive response from a student but just sort of says we're here um, if you need to get in touch you know we're here to get in touch and, and just let you know that we're, we're around and if they're feeling that kind of cut off and a bit distance just that friendly email coming in can can make a difference to them so that that was our pearl of wisdom Absolutely. Donna, I think you were also uh, looking at what's happened so far. Hmm. I think two of the kind of biggest themes which came through were engagement um, and also students feeling vulnerable. Um, in terms of engagement, I think we had a kind of, I'm from the Open University, but we had people from a different a range of universities and all of us said that engagement is tricky. Um, it can be tricky at the best of times, but it's particularly tricky now with some students not having good IT access, etc. Um, and we felt that maybe uh, universities or departments which had um, a kind of good support technology processes in place before the pandemic were in a really good place to respond to students during the pandemic. So, for instance, if you kind of have, you know, communication channels, social media, established forums, etc., that can kind of put you in a, in, a, in, a, in really a really good place to respond. So maybe that's something that we need to kind of think about um, in the future, regardless of what's happening um, with the pandemic. And the second thing uh, which came up was about students being vulnerable, um, particularly um, students perhaps who are widening participation. Um, um, students may be vulnerable anyway, but they might be particularly so at the moment with um, you know, the stress of being stuck at home, financial problems, domestic violence, etc. So um, that's something that we all need to have at the forefront of our, of our plans. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Um, as usual, I have talked rather more than I intended to, so time is a running on here. Anybody from the middle groups where, where I, I know I, I was in one of them and they, we had a really good discussion about what's happening this summer and uh, whether we're actually going to communicate with students, be they those who are joining our institutions, our returners, or also the ones graduating this summer. Um, how are we going to deal with those? So anyone from th those middle room discussions? I think Joni Willett said that she was in one of those and has offered to speak on the chat. Joni? Hi. Um, oh, you've automatically unmuted me. That's interesting. Um, uh, I think through... Um, uh, we're talking about how over the past few weeks we've had, you know, really quite intense communications with the students. Um, and so, uh, but now, so in my university, for example, um, University of Exeter, the Fenwyn campus, um, uh, we're, you know, we're now kind of, our, our teaching's finished and we're now um, mostly through exam season and there's a lot of marking and stuff like that. So we've had a lot less communication with the students more generally. A lot of our focus has been about trying to um, upskill colleagues with regards to using the various different kinds of technologies that are available. Most of us totally with you on the whole pigeon front, Mark. Um, 
so 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 for us it's been a lot of our own preparation and i think one of the things that we're going to need to do um, before the students come back is about think about how we bring the students along with that as well um, and get them familiar with the kind of platforms that we're going to be using um, and i love your thing about a, a virtual graduation i think that's something that would be really useful for us to think about actually Excellent. Anybody else want to pitch in on these summer communications, the, the middle group discussions? I shan't force people, so we shall move on. Um, so what about the future for those people who I plonked into the middle of September? What's the world look like for you? I mean, we are all so speculative about what is going to happen and how we're going to be delivering our teaching in the awesome term and beyond. Uh, is it going to change the way that we engage with students? I would be really interested to hear from anyone in those rooms seven, eight or nine. I know Roger, and, and in fact, Roger is raising his hand. Uh, if my colleagues who have the skills of unmuting can bring Roger in, that would I be think that's, I think they've just mute, unmuted me, Mark. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, our group was discussing about that. I mean, I think there was understandably quite a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, a big, a big vote for the don't knows. But um, I think also, uh, I think there was a concern from several of us about um, sort of inconsistency or, or possibly that existing inequalities amongst many students may actually be being sort of exaggerated, exacerbated by the current situation and maybe many of our students who come from more difficult backgrounds or more disadvantaged backgrounds that you know, they are going to be suffering particularly from isolation or you know, really suboptimal working conditions when they're at home. Um, so I, th I think that was uh, a key thing. I, I think overall you know there was still certainly some uncertainty about how we're going to deliver sort of the formal teaching part but i think there's probably even more uncertainty about in many cases how we're going to do the you know a lot of the stuff that you've been talking about mark the, the sort of you know the, the student welfare uh, student support side kind of you know, the stuff around the around the formal curriculum um and in particular how we can make sure that though lots of students are not just falling through the cracks um i think that was kind of pretty much a shared concern ac across our group um I, I i don't think we came up with any spectacularly yeah, original uh, answers for that, but um, we, we spent a bit of time talking about the problems. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Roger. Anyone else want to pitch in there before I move on? I know that we are in the last seven minutes of this session now. And if there are any particular questions that people want to raise in the last couple of minutes, last few minutes, bung them in the chats now and we can pick them up. Um, what I'm going to attempt to share my screen again. Going back to where do we go from here and actually a build on exactly what roger has just said um there is no magic bullet there is no one simple solution that we can all take away from this meeting and everything about student engagement will be all right it absolutely isn't we are all finding our way and if anybody feels unconfident about it well join the club there's a whole load of the rest of us i suspect in exactly the same same situation uh, but we will find ways but this is not a summer where we can switch off uh, in terms of engaging with the students we don't yet have who are going to be our joiners in the autumn who will not have joined the university that they were expecting in the way that they were expecting it to look and to feel we've got to make them welcome for our students who are transitioning from first year to second year second to third year whatever it may be who are returning from placements mainly or many of which have been cut short who have had their study abroad uh, cut short or made much more difficult than it should have been we have got to keep those conversations going. We have to keep talking to them more so, we have to keep listening to them. For those of our colleagues who think as soon as the June boards are done, they can pack up, head to the countryside and stick their nose in a book for the next three months, it's not going to be that kind of summer. 
And I don't think we should be allowing colleagues to do that at the expense of those who are perhaps a little bit more teaching focused who will have to pick up their slack. Um, I know in my university, we are very seriously considering deferring research leave next year. That will hit hard and hit tough for a lot of people. But this is supposedly a once in a century circumstance. Be prepared to fail. We all do that quite a lot in university and kind of skirt around it quite often. Um, let's be more honest about it. Let's find stuff that works. Let's find stuff that doesn't work, but let's never be afraid to try stuff. And for me, this is stuff that is focused on students. And listen to those students. Listen to the ones who've become noisy or have gone quiet. Listen out for the difference. What are you not expecting? Do you need to talk to them a bit more? Do you need to go back to those referrals and find the right person to pick that student up, to do that listening with them, to discover what it is that's not right for them? We're not counsellors, we shouldn't try to be, we're not going to fix things, but we might be that person who listens and that person who can make a difference. I had one last slide, oh, keep the conversations going, of course, and if this conversation, if you want to keep this conversation going with me, I would love to keep talking to you or keep talking to each other, absolutely. Um, you've been wonderful. I've been here and I'm going to turn my screen off, stop sharing it so that if there are any last questions coming up in the chat, I do weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever it may be. Um, chat's going through a lot quicker than I can read it here, but John or Donna, are there any questions in the last three minutes that you would like me to respond to? I've not seen any come up, Donna. Uh, I don't think there have been any. No, no major questions. There was some discussion about um, maybe the difference between the UK, Europe and USA. Um, any, any thoughts about how people are, you know, the, the differences in engagement, um, that might be a good place for us to kind of follow up on Twitter unless people have any specific kind of comments to make here. Well, for once in my life, I've actually done something to time. Um, okay, so it just really falls to me to thank some people, to thank you, Mark, for doing a talk today, which I think has been extremely helpful in terms of focusing us on uh, the well-being of students and also, I think, in the discussion of well-being of, of staff colleagues uh, and is particularly apt, as you uh, commented, in uh, Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, for us to be doing this. A thank to Jamie Roberts and the team at PSA office uh, who have uh, put all of the, the mechanics of this in place and logistics and wonderfully handled the putting us into into chat rooms. That was absolutely uh, superb and I think we've probably all, all bit learned something that we could do uh, maybe with our own students uh, 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 on that. And also just to, um, if you have just joined us today for the first time, to make you aware that our next um, presentation is next uh, Wednesday, Georgina Blakely of the University of Huddersfield, uh, formerly of the Un Open University, will be talking about the differences between online and distance universities and some of the learning that we can have there. And then in uh, the week after, Christine Liston Bandier from the University of Leeds talking about scaffolding learning and then Natalie Jester from University of Bristol. Uh, talking about asynchronous teaching. So please go to the PSA website to uh, to sign up for all those. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of a glorious sunny afternoon. Thank you very much.